Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, welcome to this edition of Leaders Angle. This morning we have a new angle on Leaders Angle, insofar as we have together with the usual sponsors, the USB, USB ED, the Alumni Society and the Institute for Futures Research, we have the Private Wealth Management of Old Mutual and also PPS. And our topic for this morning is wealth management. Our speakers are firstly Mr. Nikut Kutsi. He has got more than six years of experience in the financial services industry. He holds a bachelor's degree in institutional investments from Stellenbosch University, an honors degree in financial analysis and portfolio management from UCT, and he is a CFA charter holder. And our second speaker is Ms. Tania Rousseau. Um, she is a certified financial planner, holds a postgraduate diploma in financial planning. Uh, she is a professional member of the Financial Planning Institute, and she's got 23 years of financial services industry experience. Welcome to both of you, and we look forward to what you have to say. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us. I thank you someone this morning. If I had to get up this morning and listen to myself for this weather, I probably would have stayed in bed, but thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, it's a bit of a funny venue, so I'm just going to walk around. Hopefully all of you can hear me. Can you guys hear me in the back there? Yes, fine. Um, yes, I'm, I'm from PPS Investments, actually. The PPS, for those of you that don't know, is the Professional Providence Society. The reason why I say that is because today, the way I've structured my whole presentation is I'm going to look at retirement planning in South Africa, but I'm going to look at it like I'm a doctor, and we're going to do a proper diagnosis of, of the situation. We're going to identify the symptoms, and then I'm going to give you a couple of pointers as to how to get around these, these problems. And please, if you have any questions, don't, don't hesitate to ask First of all, I want to start off with a shocking statistic. You guys would have read the, the invitation, but for those of you that don't know, that is not the, the inflation rate. The inflation is about double that, that number. That is actually the number of South Africans that can fund their retirement at age 65. Obviously, that's a, that's a scary statistic. Now, the, the, the question is, why can't people fund their retirement? Well, basically because of three reasons. The first one is they're not saving enough. The second, fund, the second reason is because they, they, they're getting low investment returns, and the third one is because of high fees. So you definitely don't want to become part of the statistics. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to go through those three symptoms and look at exactly what I mean by, by each of them. Okay, so just to give you some evidence that, that, that it is in fact true, if you, if you look at the replacement ratio, now the replacement ratio is the percentage of your salary that your pension income provides for. The ideal replacement ratio is about 60% of your salary. And if we look at what's happening in developing countries, people there retire with more or less 75% of their, their salary. <coughs> for the more developed countries, it's, it's about 56%. Now, if we look at the situation in South Africa, the average is 30%. So it's a lot lower than it is in the rest of the world. And for women, it's less than 28%. So there is definitely a problem in South, Af South Africa that people when they retire, they don't have enough money to fund the, the, the income. And if we just look at this, this is your, this is the, um, the target annual salary of 13 times when you retire versus what the pension industry in South Africa has actually done. And we can see that there's a huge, huge savings gap there. And that just means that pensioners are in trouble. A lot of pensioners are retiring today, and you see it every day when we work with clients thinking that, a million rand or two million rand is, is enough to fund their, their, their retirement when in fact it's not. And what we're seeing, especially amongst our professional clients, is that people are living longer, which means that instead of having to fund your retirement for 15 years, you're now having to fund it for 20, 25 years. And that, the, the, the extra five or ten years at the end of your retirement um, can make a huge difference to the amount of capital that you need when you actually reach that retirement age. Okay, so. That's the diagnosis there. We've identified three symptoms. Now, the first symptom is not saving enough. Okay, so what does that mean? Now, this is a situation that the, the guys from private wealth can, can attest to that we face with every day. Uh, clients walk into the office, they say, look, I haven't saved the time. 
is your chance to become a legend. And unfortunately, when you get to that stage, it's, it's a little bit late. Okay, so let's look at some of the things that, what I mean around not saving enough. First of all, we know in South Africa there's a very, very poor savings culture. Most people do not contribute on a monthly basis sufficiently enough to, to fund for the retirement. Most people in South Africa don't reserve. Now, what I mean by reserve is, is when you change jobs. And we know that it's not like it was 10, 15 years ago when people stay in the same job for their whole lifetime. So they do uh, jump around it, but you do, get, you do find job hopping. Now, unfortunately, what we're finding is that every time people change, instead of preserving their retirement capital that they've pulled up, they withdraw the money and they, they spend it. Um, most people, unfortunately, start the earliest that situation you know, where they say, it's fine, I'll, I'll start saving next year, I'll start saving next year. Um, and then we also have a situation where I think all of us want to retire earlier than we probably should. Uh, but just a, an important thing to note there is that if you retire two years early, earlier, not only have you saved two years less, but you have to fund that, that retirement for two years longer. And then most people take the full withdrawal benefit of one third of retirement. Now that NSSRR is the National Social Security and Retirement Reform. They have identified those issues as well, and a lot of what the, the retirement reform is dealing with focuses on, on those issues. So if we just go through them in a little bit more detail. Um, if you look at insufficient monthly contributions, now what I've done here is I've just taken a 500 rand debit order and compared it with a 5,000 rand debit order. You can see the value that you get if you find it is, is significantly different. In fact, the, the net growth that you get, if you look at the total cost and compare that with the actual value of retirement, you, you're spending 120000 and you're getting 614000 if you're saving 500 rand a month. If you take it one step further, you can see the difference between saving 500 rand a month and saving 5000 is, is, is huge. And it doesn't sound like a lot of money, but because of the effect of compounding, there's a huge impact on the value that you actually have when you, when you retire. The second one is, like I said before, not preserving on retirement. I'm going to give you some numbers. 40% of, of funds with more than 1 million rand in South Africa isn't preserved. That's a scary thought. Though. The, social, the retirement reform is focusing on allowing smaller people to be able to withdraw their, their retirement capital. But if you look at the guys that have built up significant assets, it seems like... 40% of them are just withdrawing those assets and, and spending it. 75% um, of members, and this is especially amongst younger members, uh, of funds with more than 300,000 do not preserve their retirement capital as well. Now what you're doing is you, every time you withdraw your retirement capital, you're reducing it, you're starting from scratch again. You, so you don't get the benefit of that, uh, of that interest on interest, or that compound interest as they call it. And by, by doing that, you are reducing your your capital at retirement by 67%. Okay, so that, that does have a huge impact. Most people start too late, and we often see this. Now, if you just look at this table, what I've done here is I've compared a guy that starts at age 25, 35, 40, and 55, um, and looked at it starting with, with 500 rand a month, escalating that by 10% by per year, compared to 5,000 rand, escalating that by 10% by per year. Now, if you just look at that table, you can see that the guy that starts at age 40 with 500 rand a month is similar to a person that starts at age 55 with 5,000 rand a month. Okay, so, so by waiting 10, 10 years later, you actually have to increase your, your contribution 10, 10 times. Um, so it does make sense to you. The earlier you can start, the, the better. And then investors retire too, too early. Now, if we look at this table, what I've done is I've looked at how much money do I need if I retire at age 55, 60, 65, and 70. Now, if you want to, if you want 360,000 rand per, per annum, and you retire at 60, you need to have saved about 3.2 million rand. If you retire at 65, you will need to have saved about 2.9 million rand. So it just shows you, the earlier you retire, you better make sure that you have enough money to fund those last couple of years. And then the, the full third. We know that when people retire on pension funds, they have the option of taking one third in cash, and then the other two-thirds have to be a new tie, so they have to draw an income out of the other two-thirds. Now, if you just compare these, these different values at retirement, and we look at the number of years it will take for the capital to run out, okay, assuming that we need 50,000 rand per annum. If you save 1 million rand, that money will last you only four years. If you save 2 million, it will last you seven and a half years. 
hope you listened to this presentation, you would have saved seven and a half million, which will last you 36 years. Okay, so then the question is, so we know that there's a problem. People aren't saving enough. We've looked at the reasons why. How do you save? And what, what I often found is we tell people to save, but they're not always sure exactly how, how and where to go and do it. Now, first of all, all of us that are employed contribute to a pension or a provident fund. Or all of us should contribute to a pension or a provident fund. That's the one place where you save. Now, unfortunately for, for South Africans, that is, in a lot of cases, the only place where they save. They say that they, I don't have to go and buy any other investment products because I have a pension or a provident fund. As you've just seen, in most cases, that will not be enough to, to fund your retirement. The second place you can go and save is, is in direct investments. That's going and buying shares directly in the stock market. Um, or going and investing your money in, in direct securities. Third place is by collective investments. That's the, the old unit trusts. And if you look at the retirement savings products in South Africa, most of them have as an underlying building blocks collective investments or unit trusts. For those of you that don't know what a collective <coughs> investment is, very simply speaking, it's they pool assets of various small investors together and then in a trust and then use that money to go and buy any, any uh, underlying instrument on their behalf. So an equity collective investment or an equity unit trust would pool assets together and then go and buy shares in the, in the, in the stock market. Uh, some of the products, uh, you can invest in an endowment, which is a tax-efficient savings vehicle for those people that are are taxed at the, at the highest marginal rate of tax. Retirement annuities, which you'll see at the beginning of next year, will start getting a lot of press. And the reason why, I don't know if you've noticed that, why suddenly everyone starts talking about retirement annuities, <coughs> because they're used as a, a vehicle. You can actually deduct your contributions up to a certain level, um, your, your retirement annuity contributions from your, from your gross income. And then preservation funds, which is the vehicle that you use if you transfer from one job to the next. Okay, so instead of taking that money, you can transfer it to a preservation fund without paying any tax. And the tax that you pay on those retirement fund withdrawals are, is, is very, very high. Just a couple of notes on why collective investments. Like I said before, a lot of the, or most of the retirement products in South Africa have as the underlying investments unit trusts or collective investments. Now, first of all, just some of the, the features of these products is, first of all, it gives you choice. Now, we were just having a discussion before this presentation started about choice, and unfortunately, what's happened with a lot of the product providers is they've given people too much choice. Um, if you look at the number of funds available in South Africa, there are about 700 plus unit trust funds that you can choose from, which just makes it incredibly difficult. There are almost there are more unit trusts to choose from than the old shares, and every single one of them has a different bandwidth. Um, what we're seeing happening in the industry is people are almost going back to where they were 10, 15 years ago in terms of limiting choice. So instead of giving you everything, I'm going to give you the 30 funds that I think are, are high quality good funds. Uh, collective investments are very flexible, so it's very easy to move from one to the next. Uh, very transparent, you can see exactly what they invest in, what the underlying investments are, what the actual fees are. I'm going to talk about fees in the, in the third portion because I'm sure that you guys will have some questions there. They're very accessible. Uh, what, what I mean by that is um, if you had to, let's say for instance you want to go and invest in government bonds. So in Africa if you want to buy a government bond you have to invest at least a million rand. So another way of getting access to government bonds is by investing by a collective investment and they will then go and invest in your behalf. They can be cost effective, um, but like I said I'm going to talk about fees in the last part of the presentation. Very liquid, you don't have to find a seller if you want to repurchase your collective investments so the, the management company has to buy them back from you. And the last one, which I almost added as an afterthought yesterday, but I think I should have actually put this first, is you're protected against institutional failure. And we've seen a lot of that happening lately. I don't know if you guys have been following the news, but some of the, <coughs> the big global brands have been going bust. Um, and if we think uh, in a South African context, if we think back a couple of years to the whole financial situation where um, you had a couple of dodgy guys running around um, selling dodgy products, at least the guys in the unit trust were protected. So they can't access your, your funds in the unit trust because it's, it's not, it doesn't form part of the management company's balance sheet. It's actually all their balance sheet. Okay. Okay, so that's symptom number one. I'm going to show you guys how to deal with it. End. Now, if you just look at the second symptom, low investment returns, and you've certainly seen a lot of those people walking around recently. 
uh, people that are licking their wounds from, from backing in the market. And it's quite funny. I mean, we had five or six, five or six really good years in, in the markets where basically everything went up, which is also why we find the number of funds that we do in South Africa. It was got quite easy to, to be an asset manager. All you had to do was buy equities. They, everyone knew that they were going to keep going up, so launch your own fund, buy equities, charge a mass nice fee. Unfortunately, that situation has changed now. As, as you guys will know, it's getting a lot more difficult to determine where the value is going to be going forward. Um, and often when I speak to, to investors, they, they complain about their, their product. My RA, oh, RA is well, that's a shocking product. You must stay away from it. Unitrust, stay away from Unitrust. And very often, the, the problem is, is that they don't understand that there's a difference between the wrapper and the underlying investment. Often people blame the product for the poor performance, but the reason why the product's not performing is because of the underlying selection of funds. Now, if I had to ask you guys, how many of you know which funds you're invested in within your pension fund or even within your retirement community? How many of you would be able to tell me? I think not many. Most people who say, I've got an RA and that's fine. <coughs> how many of you guys know that you might have had some exposure to this subprime crisis that's happening in the US? Well, if you had some foreign exposure in your pension or provident fund or in your RA, there's a good chance that you've had some exposure to it. But most people don't look at it like that. They look at it on a product level. So it's very important that when you do look at a product, you must distinguish between the features of the product or the wrapper and the features of the underlying investments and to be aware of what's happening in that, in that specific product. Okay, so poor market timing. Um, yeah, I'm going to say a little bit more about that in a minute. Then herd behavior, and I'm going to tell you guys exactly what herd behavior is. Buddha rata, that's what I sometimes call them. Focus on nominal returns rather than real returns, and then lastly, reckless conservatism, which is, is very prevalent in, in South Africa. Those are some of the reasons for the poor investment returns that investors have experienced. First of all, if we just look at why asset allocation is important. Now, I don't want to go into too much detail, but basically what, there was a report done by Hewitt and Captain, uh, which was published in the Financial Analyst Journal in, two in, in the year 2000, where they looked at how important is the asset allocation decision. Now, asset allocation, simply speaking, is how much should I, be, should I have invested in equities, bonds, cash, property, and products? How important is that decision? First of all, in terms of determining the absolute level of your returns, 100% of your returns are determined by which asset class you, you've invested in. Secondly, if you look at the uh, variability of the fund's returns, so the bounciness of the returns, about 92% of, of that bounciness is determined by, by, the, um, by your asset allocation decision. And then 40% of the, the difference in fund's returns is, is, is determined by asset allocation. So the point I'm trying to make here is it's, it's more important to be in the right asset class than to be with the right fund manager. I often come across people that say, I want to invest in this manager. I want to invest with this guy. I don't care where they put the money. Okay, now, that's, that's a mistake. I mean, you have to understand exactly where your money is invested. Otherwise, because at the end of the day, that's going to determine what your, what your retirement capital is worth. Now, if we just look at this, this is a, this is a graph that was, was produced by the Department of, of Economics. University, but there's one from Merrill Lynch as well, and this is a classic investor behavior. Where you get the self phase where no one really knows about it, no one's, no one's talking about the share, uh, and then you get the media phase, that's what I'm going to talk about. That's where it starts getting media attention, there's a lot of enthusiasm in the public, um, a lot of greedy people start no noticing, you start hearing conversations at rise where people are saying, geez, you know, I bought, bought this share, things doubled. Then you, start, you, you always hear people saying it's a new paradigm. We all heard with the IT stocks, it was a new paradigm, the new economy. Everything's different now. You can't, you can buy shares on a, on a PE ratio of 40. It makes sense, it's a new economy. Even though it's twice there, there long term history. And then suddenly things start crashing. What's the first thing that happens? People go into denial. No, 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 it's just a short term, but it's fine, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hang on to this keeps falling and then it jumps up again and that's what, what's called a bull trap. People think, they think that the market's turned, but actually it's, uh, it hasn't turned. It's just a short term, uh, short term cyclist that's going through. And then it starts to turn into normal. That's where we find fear, capitulation, and then despair. Now what happens, as you go through this part, 
the site to where do people normally buy and sell? Well, they normally buy on the mania phase, right at the top, when the thing's already had the good performance. And where do they sell? When it's at the bottom, which is exactly the opposite of, of what you should be doing. Now, I, I read a, quite a nice article a while ago where the guy was saying that the share prices are very cheap. Now, everywhere else we love a discount. Uh, you, you go to Woolies, we all love discounts, it's nice and cheap. But for some reason, when we think about shares, it's the complete opposite. What they should do is they should have a guy that is standing in front of the JC every day saying that, I've got a special for you guys, prices are off today, um, come to the market. And the next day if the market keeps going down, he's still there saying, look guys, it's even cheaper than it was yesterday. Start buying now. And maybe that will change the whole sentiment around being in the JSC. But unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. We, uh, you just have to look at the ACI stats, which is the, the inflows into collective investments over the last quarters. What's happened? People are rushing into money market. Um, selling where? It's too late now. Okay, so market time. Not even the fund managers get this right, just by the way. So don't feel bad. And if you've had a couple of dodgy calls on the asset allocation side, the asset managers also battle with market time. It's very difficult to get right. And then you get this thing called herd behavior. Herd behavior is when you stand around the the, the bright place and the guy says, listen, everything's going up, you have to buy now. And then you start reading it in the papers. And everyone's doing this, I have to get it now. That's her behavior. Now, we found a study that was done in the U.S. on mutual funds. Mutual funds are just what the, what the Americans call unit trusts. And they looked at the performance of the market versus the funds versus the actual <coughs> investors' returns over a period of 20 years. Now, over that period, the market gave you about say 13%. So the equity, if you just invested in the equity market in the US, it would have given you about 13% annualized. The actual funds that invested in the market gave you 70% of the market. Why? Because of fees, because of poor timing, basically. The investor only got 48%. Why is that? Because it's like a racehorse, it's wonderful in investments. You start on one horse and if you see this one isn't working, then you just move to the next horse. Or the other example I like to use is I live in the northern suburbs and I work in the southern suburbs. So every morning I get stuck in traffic. Now, I always think of this, of this investment thing when I get stuck in traffic. You always think that the lane next to you is the faster one. So you keep changing and then as soon as you get into that lane you get stuck in this one. And you keep jumping back and forth. And what happens at the end of the day, if you just stay in the in in lane that you started and you would have been there a lot earlier. Now that's similar to, to what's happening here. These investors kept chopping and changing. That's why they only got 48% of the, or less than half of the market's returns. And why did they do that? Because they we had this herd behavior. They kept following the crowd. They kept going back to that thing where, oh, this greed and delusion, this new paradigm story. Okay. The other point that I'd like to make is very often people think in nominal terms. Now, nominal terms and real returns, what's the difference? Real return is your return after inflation. Why is that important? Well, first of all, inflation, if, you don't, if you're not protecting your wealth against inflation, then you're actually getting poorer. So I often, I often get confronted by people wanting to buy these old school guaranteed products. Because this thing gives me a guarantee of 10% on my capital. But I have to stay invested for five years. And it gives me a guaranteed return of 10%. Now, that's wonderful if inflation's 5 But if, in, if inflation is 13%, then that, that capital guarantee doesn't mean anything. Because you're actually getting poorer in real terms. Yes, your investment might have gone up, but in real terms, you've actually you've gone backwards. Okay, so it's very important to think in real terms. What has this thing given me above inflation? If we go back to 98, we had inflation as high as 20%. And what, what did you get in money markets? Money markets were sky high. And people thought that they were getting a good deal. But in actual fact, if you look at it off the tax and off the inflation, they were making a loss. They were going backwards. This is what we call the well graph, something produced by an investment team. It compares an investor that gets inflation, which is the, the orange um, bar, with uh, an investor that gets inflation plus four um, between the ages of 55 and 65. And we can see, and sorry, on the x-axis there you can see that's the guy's age. So by getting inflation plus 4%, your capital will last a lot longer. Plus you'll be able to draw a much higher income. Okay, so it makes a huge difference whether you get 
inflation or inflation plus two, four, or six. And that's why we've also seen a proliferation of funds in South Africa with inflation benchmarks. If you go back five, ten years, the majority of the balance funds in South Africa had what we call composite benchmarks, which basically said, I mean, if, if you were a financial advisor and you had to explain to a person, so what is my expectation for returns in this balance fund? The guy would have told you 60% all C, 15% all B, 15% Steffi, and 10% and MECR. What the hell does that mean? What, what is your expectation? You don't know, but that's actually what they targeted. Nowadays, we're finding more funds which target inflation plus 2, inflation plus 4. So you've got a better understanding of what this fund should be producing over time. Okay. The reason for that is because I think the asset management industry has caught up with the financial planning industry where they've realized that this is actually what investors want. The other point that, I, that I'd like to make is, is reckless conservatism. And this is something that we encounter every single day, where investors, as soon as there's a slight shift in the market, they run to the market. I'm not saying that they shift money, they change the allocation. They actually withdraw all their money from wherever the money was invested and just pump it into money market. Now, oh, this is a, a, a table that was produced by PQ, Perry and Quant, and they looked at the, the three-year real return of cash. Okay, so if you look at the three-year running returns of cash compared to inflation, you can see there's a lot of it. What does that mean? It means that cash consistently over long periods of time will underperform inflation. Okay, so now, this is before tax. If I take it off, if I take it off the tax, it's going to look even worse. <coughs> You must remember, money market only produces interest, which is taxed at, at your marginal rate of return. <coughs> the second thing is, if you look at the probability of the various asset classes of actually giving you a return above inflation, and you take equities, cash, and bonds, and you compare that two to one another, you can see that over a long time, uh, sorry, over a, a long investment horizon, equities actually give you a much better chance of generating real return in cash flow. Yes, obviously over the short term they're a lot more volatile. So if you're investing for a year, you don't want to put all your money into an equity fund. But I mean, if you if you've just done some more work, that says if you look over a period of seven years, after seven years the risk that you have in your in your equity fund is more or less the same as the as the risk that you have in your cash and bond investments. Okay, so if you've got an investment horizon of of more than six years, then you should have a good chunk of your money invested in, in high risk. Okay, and then diversification is the one scenario. You're not supposed to see all of this, but basically the point I'm trying to make here, is these are all the various asset classes in the, in the American market. And so what they've done is they've ranked them from worst performance from the, from the bottom to the best performance to the top over the various years. It looks a bit like a quilt. Um, and the reason why it does is because there's no asset class that consistently outperforms any of the other assets. So they're very inconsistent. So the one here you have property up there and equities down there and will change around. Now uh, we've already seen that investors are very poor at market timing. Now, we, now I'm showing you that the returns are very consistent. So what I, the point I'm trying to make is get a diversified portfolio, let the portfolio managers manage the day-to-day -day trading. You get a, a diversified portfolio that's aligned with your strategic objective or your goals. So you go to a guy, you say, this is the return that I want. You get a portfolio that's spread across all the various asset classes. And then you don't react on what happens on a daily basis. We've seen a lot of emotion in this market, and not just from normal retail investors, from the actual traders and the institutional investors in the market, where they, they're jumping around every day. You just have to look at the, the volatility that we see in the market, instead of just sticking to the long-term strategic objective. And by the way, if I did this for asset managers, it's the same situation. They, they tend to be quite inconsistent because the market does go through, through cycles. Okay, so the benefits of diversification is you only change your portfolio when your circumstances change. Okay, what do I mean by that? I mean, if something happens, if you say, look, I want, I'm, my risk profile has changed. I only have three years left until retirement. I should not be invested in a highly aggressive portfolio. I should be tempering my, my risk and my portfolio. Second thing is you're not dependent on one asset class to perform to do well in your portfolio. The negative correlation, very often people, people are afraid to, to get exposure to the offshore markets. Now what you can actually do by including an, 
the offshore markets in your portfolios, you can get higher returns without necessarily increasing your risk because there's a negative correlation uh, between the local and, the, and some of the offshore markets. And you get smoother, more consistent returns. Okay. So the last symptom is high fees. Um, now, this is probably when, when you speak to investors, this is the, the their biggest complaint against the industry as a whole, is high fees. And I think justifiably so. They, they definitely, historically, have been people and products that have, that have overcharged investors, <coughs> which has definitely depleted their, their returns. So four things I'm going to look at quickly is just the tyranny of costs, the dark side of compound interest, uh, types of fees, uh, and then look at initial versus ongoing, because often I find investors are so focused on, I just want that initial fee to be as low as possible, and then they completely forget about the ongoing fees. And then performance fees, which is also something that's sort of a favorite in the retail market. But I don't think people understand it that well. Um, and a lot of asset managers are getting away with murder, charging very, very high performance fees. Okay, so this is, this is just looking at uh, an investment of 100,000 rand, assuming a growth <coughs> rate of 12%. Now the red line <coughs> is the value after 30 years, if there's no fees, and the gray line is if there's a, a fee of 4% per annum. <coughs> now you can see a fee difference of 4% per annum actually means that the day that you buy, you triple your retirement capital. So it's very important to get that ongoing fee as low as possible. Okay, try and drive it down. And I, of, I also find that people don't really understand the types of fees. What am I supposed to be paying for? Now, the easy way to remember this is a PH. You pay for advice, you pay for administration, and you pay for asset management. Those are the fees that you should be paying for. The, the, we, we find other fees in the market as well, which can and should actually be avoided. Fees like with gold penalties and fees, policy fees, switching fees, uh, marketing fees. These are all fees that you find in a lot of the older products that can actually be avoided by, by investing in, in a new generation product. And then initial versus ongoing. I'm sure you guys have heard of these, of some of these products which say, I will give you a 100% allocation. Now, unfortunately, what that often means is all they're doing is they're just deferring the initial fee. They're just taking that initial fee and they're spreading it out over the term of the investment. So be very careful that you understand, or make sure that you understand whether that fee is zero or whether that fee is just being spread across the, the whole investment term. Now, initial fees, and, and the initial fees are levied on those three levels, admin, advice, asset management. It's got a smaller impact over time. Normally works on a sliding scale basis, so the more you invest, the lower the fee. And anything, I would say anything higher than 5%, which is already high, is, is excessive. So if, you, if a guy's quoting you on a product and it's more than 5% up front, he's ripping you off. Um, on an ongoing basis, it's got a much bigger impact over time, if you, as you've just seen in that, that graph that I showed you, that difference of, of 4%. Also normally works on a sliding scale. And anything higher than, I would say, 4% per annum is, is excessive. And when I say 4%, I'm including everything. Advice, administration, and <coughs> And then just a couple of comments on performance fees. Performance fees, basically what these performance fees are, is that they're saying, if I do well, then, then you pay. If I don't do well, then you don't pay. That's what it says in principle. <coughs> Unfortunately, the way it's implemented in South Africa, it's not exactly that. There are a couple of things that you always have to check. First of all, check if there's a basic fee. Very often, they have a basic fee and a performance fee. So the basic fee is 1.5% per annum, plus then they add a performance fee. Don't forget to add those two together. Second thing is check the benchmark. We find, we've done a lot of research on this, and you find a lot of funds in South Africa with a benchmark of cash. And they charge, and, and then they're investing 85% in equity. Now, if you're investing only 5% of equity, let's say equity is like it's 2006, 2007. You get equities does, they do 30%. Cash does 10%. They've outperformed their benchmark by 20%, and then they take their performance fees 20% of our performance. Okay, that's a nice way to build an asset management business. So just be very careful. Always check the benchmark. Make sure that the benchmark makes sense. Second thing is check the watermark. Now, the watermark says if it goes, if the fund goes up, 
goes down again, that watermark stays in place. So that, they will only charge fees once it goes through that watermark again. If they don't have a watermark, it means if that thing goes up, goes down, and then goes back up to the same level, you're going to pay performance fees again. Okay, so always ask, what is, does this thing have a high watermark? Because if it doesn't, then you're going to pay for all those little squiggles. Every time it goes back up, you're going to pay for things. And then check the measurement period. That is very, very important. If they say my benchmark is cash, but I'm measuring it over a five-year period, now I've just told you that over five, six years, the risk in equities is more or less the same in cash, but obviously the returns are a lot higher. So if your performance, performance fee is measured over rolling five-year periods, then the day you invest, you are paying for performance that the guys got five years ago. Okay. You didn't get any of that performance, but you're paying the maximum fee. So the performance fee should actually be as that the measurement period should be as short as possible. If it's very long, then, then stay away. Because just think, think of it like this. If the performance fee measurement period is three years, then they can, they can underperform for two years and you can still be paying the maximum performance fee. Okay. So all I'm saying is watch out for balance funds with very flexible mandates, low benchmarks, and long measurement periods. Okay. So when you see any of that, then, then be careful. Okay, so those are the three symptoms. <coughs> Quickly, how, to, how do we avoid becoming part of that statistic? Um, I think a lot of people are living in a fairy tale. They're thinking that this doesn't really apply to me and this is being taken care of by my financial advisor or someone else. We each have to take responsibility for our own environment. It doesn't help to sit back and try and blame it on, on someone else. Okay, so like I said before, we've identified the symptoms. Let's look at the dilemmas. First of all, you have to determine how much you will need at retirement. That should be your starting point. How much am I going to need the day that I retire? We've seen that the sooner you start, the better. Okay. Even if it's just 200 rand a month, it makes a huge difference. And don't stop halfway through the course. So when you do change jobs, try and preserve as much of that capital as possible. <coughs> Secondly, listen to the doctor. He is the expert. So don't try to find the more. Don't try and chop and change and move out of money markets and move back into shares. Stick to a diversified portfolio. Stay away from herd behavior. If you've got your portfolio in place, don't get confused and get lured by guys that tell you that they can guarantee you 50% for It doesn't exist. Um, and there's a, a quote from Warren Buffett that I always use. It's, he always says, it's time in the market, not time in the market. So like I showed you, if you stay in equities, more than six years, your risk is low and your, your real returns are a lot higher. Um, don't get lulled into a false sense of security. Look at the real returns, so the returns above inflation. And we've seen that over time, cash doesn't give you consistently high real returns. Okay. And then, I also thought about this. If, if you buy medicine, don't be afraid of buying generic medicine. Okay. So don't be afraid of buying generic. Why? Well, because in investments, if it's, you're getting the same thing at a much cheaper price, which is often the case in medicine as well. Always make sure that you understand exactly what you're paying for. Don't just sign and just assume everything is unfedorian. Advice fees are always negotiable. Look at the total expense ratios of funds. This is a thing that was introduced about a year and a half, two years ago. Every single unit trust fund in South Africa must display a total expense ratio. That thing includes all the fees. So if it's a, especially if there's a performance fee attached to it, ask for the total expense ratio because that will, that will very clearly show you, the, show you whether the performance fee is excessive. They have to include the year, last year's performance fees in the total expense ratio. Ongoing fees are more important than initial fees. So spend as much time negotiating the ongoing fees as you do the, the initial fees. Um, and don't trust performance fees. Be very, very skeptical when you get faced with funds with performance fees. Okay, and really the time to act is now. There isn't time to waste and don't, don't say to yourself, it's fine, I'll, I'll just, I'll think about it next year. Think about it now, get a sweep it up now. Okay, so just before I hand over to Tanya, just a little exercise. What I want you to do is, is pick, just look at what's closest to your age and look what's closest to your um, income required. The number that's, that corresponds to that is the amount of capital that you should have saved by now to, to be able to fund that income. So as an example, 
you are 45 now and you want 400,000 rand later to retire, then you should have saved 1.8 billion rand by now. If that's the case, then there's a good chance that you won't be part of the statistic, but if you haven't, then you're in trouble. Okay. Okay, guys, I'd like to hand over to, to Tanya. She's going to talk to you about investing in yourself. I've obviously looked at investing in your retirement and investing for the future. Tanya's going to explain to you exactly why it's important to invest in yourself as well. So looking more at it from a personal risk point of view. Any questions at this stage? I think there'll be an opportunity afterwards for questions as well. <coughs> Said, I'm sure for many of you, when you woke up in the morning and heard the rain outside, you wished you could stay in for an extra half an hour. So I want to thank you all for your attendance today. Nico spent a lot of time talking about creating wealth, more specifically with regards to retirement planning. But what I would like to focus on today is investing in risk and essentially investing in yourself. On this journey that you take with retirement planning, life will happen along the way and the consequences of life happening will have financial impacts. So I'm going to focus on what those risks are. When we hear about risk cover, I think for the lay person, when we talk about risk, we can all identify with life cover. If, if you're a family unit, when the husband or the wife passes away and has been earning an income, that person passes away, you need to protect that loss of income. There are also very many other areas of risk cover which we will also touch on today. I believe it's the financial backup. And when I say got it, keep it, I mean your lifestyle, your standard of living, assets that you've accumulated, your retirement plan, your whole financial plan. When you look at risk cover, it will enable that you're able to keep all these things that you've worked so hard to achieve. There's some harsh realities these are not scare tactics. I want you to have a look at some of these situations that are happening every day, and I want you to keep that in the back of your mind when we talk about risk cover. One in three men and one in four women will suffer from cardiovascular disease before the age of 60. Okay. 80% of heart attack patients actually survive because of the advances in medical technology. You survive the illness but you are left with consequences and implications that impact on your lifestyle. And ultimately, that will have a financial impact. Two out of three men aged 30 currently will suffer one of the core dread diseases during their lifetime. Okay, to make it effective, sometimes I will take three people in a room and say, out of the three of you gentlemen or out of the seven of you ladies, one of you is likely to get cancer during your lifetime. Almost a third of stroke patients are between the ages of 15 and 49. Again, the survival rate today is a lot higher than it used to be in the past. You survive, but that doesn't mean that you aren't affected by those illnesses. And I think the scary statistic for me is the average age of a claimant when we talk about these illnesses is 42. Okay, and I'm just looking around this room. I think most of us, the majority, are in that vulnerable age band. Keeping with the investment trend, let's look at risk cover in an investment context. We know what we look at. Nico has touched on when you do investing, what you need to look at to make sure you've got an investment, a good investment, or you've placed a good investment. If we look at the definition of investment, and I just took this off Wikipedia, it just means that you're saving or you're deferring the consumption, or it's an asset that is purchased. Obviously, you're hoping to get a good return on it. That's why you make the investment. Now, when it comes to creation of wealth, we can all identify with that. Because at the end of it all, there's going to be the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. 
So it's worth it. You may be planning short-term goals or a long-term goal like retirement planning. But with risk cover, it's not tangible. I'm sure you will all agree that it's not high on your want list. But it should be high on your need list. If we look at what makes a great investor, and those are just some examples of great investors. Nico mentioned Warren Buffett. When he bought Coca-Cola shares, he held it for four years, and actually it had no value. And somebody said to him, why are you holding on to these things? Well, I'm sure you'll all agree today that he made a good decision, and it was based on the value that he saw. But essentially what makes a good investor is you buy assets with value. Now we know when it comes to investing and creating wealth, you can look at past experience, you can look at performance, you can, <coughs> there are lots of things that Nico went into that you can actually look at. But when it comes to risk, and you consider which of your assets has the most value, I've just put some examples there. Your pension fund, your house, your car, it could be various other things which, which hold great value to you personally. But I would like to contest that you are your greatest asset. Everything that Nick has spoken about, specifically retirement planning, your whole financial plan, what funds that? Your income and your ability to earn that income. If that ability to earn your income is taken away, all the plans that you have made mean nothing. That is really what risk protection is all about. Right, some pretty pictures for those of you who aspire to climb a high mountain. It's not me. But the journey to the mountain top, your salary is the road. Reaching those objectives, your salary is funding it. Some roads are pretty. Maybe you're going to get a bonus. Maybe you're getting a 13th check. Maybe you got a refund from the receiver of revenue. Maybe you won the lotto. Sometimes it's going to be a pretty road. Sometimes it's going to be scary. Think of ESCOM, fuel prices, inflation rates, interest rates, all the negativity that are facing investors at the moment. Just briefly, if you look at risk cover, I've already said it's the financial backup for when life happens. Generically, those are the different types of areas of protection. And this is not associated to one company. This is a generic fact across the life assurance industry. You obviously protect your life, your ability to earn an income, more commonly referred to as disability protection, severe illness protection, physical impairments, and then future cover, which essentially is a benefit which guarantees your insurability. Because not all of you sitting in this room may have a need for life cover. Perhaps you don't have dependents yet and you don't see the need. But at some future point in time you will. And then you can look at those kind of benefits. Right. This to me is a very powerful slide. If we take an example of a 30-year-old male who's a non-smoker, degreed, and he takes out a million rand cover, it will cost him 173 rand per month. Let's assume he pays his premium for two months and then he dies. He will immediately get the benefit of that cover, but it would take him 40 years to get that return, investing 173 rand per month. Okay, so that is the power of risk protection or life cover or disability cover. When we look at an investment, these are the things we consider. We look at fund fact sheets. We don't have a fun fact sheet when it comes to risk cover, but you can look at the claim statistics to empower yourself and get a feel for what is actually happening in the risk space. For the purposes of this presentation, although many of these statistics are generic, I've used statistics from the old mutual. When you look at risk cover and you look at death benefit, most of the claims that are being paid out in the industry are due to accidents. 40% of deaths are not natural. So high risk areas are motor vehicle accidents and the crime and violence obviously has escalated over time. So I'm just trying to equip you. I'm trying to explain to you where the danger areas are. If you look at disability cover, 
mostly, when we think of disability, what image does that immediately conjure up in your mind? <coughs> somebody in a wheelchair, or somebody who's blind, or somebody who's, I mean, that is the natural trend that your mind takes. But if you look at the statistics in the industry, that is not what is happening to people which, which is rendering them unable to earn the income. Remember, I said, your salary is the road to financial success. If you cannot earn that income, then everything you plan means nothing. If you look at risk cover, specifically severe illnesses, we call it the big three in the industry. Cancer, heart attack, and stroke. Nine times out of ten, and go back to those statistics I told you to remember, that is what's going to happen. Okay, there are statistics of other things, but primarily it's cancer, heart attack, and stroke. So when we look at investment, we look at performance. With risk cover, you can't look at performance, but you can look at the claims payout ratios. We use the analogy of a can of Coke. We know it's one of the world's best kept secrets. Nobody knows the ingredients to a can of Coke. But I'm sure most of us who had a couple of glasses, one with the real thing and one with, which wasn't Coke, you'd be able to taste because it's, it's something tangible. But with risk cover, you don't know what you're getting. You're getting a piece of paper that promises to pay something at some future point in time when something happens. Sounds complicated, but the only way of you knowing or having the proof is if you look at claim statistics. So this is just an example, and I think the most important statistic here is why claims are not paid, again to equip you as a client. So in, in old mutual, if we just look at the 2007 statistics, they paid 99.2% of their debt claims. And that is a statistic which stretches across the industry when it comes to death claims. When you look at severe illness and disability, there's a slight difference. But the reasons why claims were not met is because of things like non-disclosure or fraud or suicide. Okay, so it's not a, a matter of the company not wanting to pay because they choose not to. There are actually valid reasons for non-payment. If we look at disability claims, 19% of disability claims in 2007 were not paid because clients were not totally and permanently disabled. I don't want to get into the, into the nitty gritty of disability and the technicalities, but make sure you understand what cover you have. Is it for temporary disability? Is it for permanent disability? And having said that, a temporary disability is 30 times more likely to happen as opposed to you suffering a permanent disability. Okay. Of the illness claims, 16% were not paid, over 13% were declined, and the reasons were because the event was not listed in the contract. Again, we're all inclined to think, I've got a trauma <coughs> cover or severe illness, whatever it's called, but do you understand what exactly is covered? So make sure of that. Otherwise, you're going to inherently have a bad experience with a company. Investing in risk cover, quick summary. Investing in your greatest asset, you, and your ability to earn an income. When you look at a fund fact sheet for risk cover, look at the claim statistics. Equip yourself. Know where the needs are, statistically. Fund performance with investments, we look at claims payout ratios. The proof is in the pudding. Look at the claim statistics of the company. And last but not least, if you've got someone you care about, invest in them. I want to end off with, I saw a slide recently which um, said that, with, and I think with all the turmoil we're going through in our country at the moment and globally, we need stable role models that we can look to. And I'm sure you will all agree that Nelson Mandela forever will, will be one of those things. And if you look at the principles that he applied to his life, I think we, we can apply them to financial planning as well. The first thing is, and Nico touched on that, you're probably going to live longer than you think. Think about retirement planning. Think about longevity. They say that the first person to live to 150 years has already been born. Okay, the longer you live, 
the more money you need, which is why you need that constant reviewing of your situation. Okay. Everybody needs a bit of advice sometime. Nelson Mandela is a great man, but I have no doubt he was surrounded by his own mentors who gave him advice. <coughs> Straight, stay true to your values and your goals, and you're going to have to be disciplined and focused. And last but not least, it's a long <coughs> walk to financial freedom. Thank you. Any questions? There's a feedback form. We're going to give you a couple of minutes to complete them, and we'll collect them from you. And there is something in it for you. We're going to be handing out some unit trust prizes. I'm told, they, told that the, the, the main prize is 1,000 Rand unit trusts, and there are two 500 Rand unit trust prizes, as well as some other lucky draw prizes. So please, if you aren't in it, you can't win it. Complete your forms. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your attendance. May I just on behalf of, uh, of everybody uh, extend a sincere word of thanks to both Nico and, and Tanya. Um, I, I must confess that when I left this morning, I wondered, gee, was it worth it? And I can um, say with conviction that indeed it was more than worth it to brave the traffic and also to brave the weather. So thank you for your pearls of wisdom. Um, you managed to convey some very important messages in a very user-friendly and very professional way. And for that, we thank you. If you'll allow me a very small commercial, I'm happy to say that Stellenbosch University um, is one of the two um, universities in the country which has full CFA accreditation. So, Nico, we're trying to produce more and more CFAs to, um, uh, to um, strengthen your, your team. Uh, and likewise, we're one of three universities in the country which offers a CFP program uh, on the basis of a postgraduate diploma in financial planning. So, Tanya, we're also working hard to produce more of your um, brain. Uh, but thank you very much. Um, a small token of my appreciation. Um, um, and thank you very much for um, spending time with us. Thank you. Thank you.